This is The Comics Alternative, Episode 216, a publisher spotlight on Kilgore Books and Comics. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Derek. And I'm Andy, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this episode, we're going to turn a critical spotlight on the 2006 releases from Kilgore Books and Comics. But before we get to that conversation, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some incredible specials. Sometimes those specials will be at 45% off cover price, sometimes as much as 50% off cover. But you know, you can occasionally find discounts that are more impressive than that. That's right. And as we're coming up on the end of November, you still have time to place an order with DCB service for uh, the November um previews catalog and this month they have as always a load of bundles that you can take advantage of where you can get 45 to 50 percent off of multiple comics from single publishers such as dc marvel and valiant so check those out that's right. They have great discounts every single month. And even if the deadline for the November orders has already passed, no worries. They accept late orders, which is good because I'm always mm-hmm. ordering late. So definitely check out DCBService.com. They'll take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your books there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Well, Andy, here we are coming into the final stretch of 2016, and we have another publisher spotlight. This will be our last one of the year, and this one's going to be on Kilgore Books and Comics. Yeah, this is something we've been talking about doing for a while, and I know you you talked to uh, the publisher, Dan, at SPX about this a while ago. Exactly. Uh, and in fact, last year, I spoke with Dan about the possibility of doing a publisher spotlight on Kilgore, and he suggested at the time that we may want to wait until either the spring or the fall of 2016 because of several projects that they had underway. And we just decided, why not look at all of Kilgore's releases from 2016, not just the spring or not just the fall releases, uh, but everything. So that's why we're doing this toward the tail end of 2016. So, yeah, there are a lot of titles that we're going to be discussing. Of the spring releases, there are Alex Graham's Cosmic Being 2, Amira Leipzig's The Fifth Window, Lauren Barnett's A Horse, A Cow, and a Hippo Walk Into a Bar, and then Box Brown's Power Man. Then there is a little interesting in-between comic that doesn't fit into the spring or fall releases, and that's Joe Matt's Paid For It. And then of the fall releases, we're going to be discussing Emmy Guinness's The Plunge, A True Story, Simon Morton's What Happened, Tom Van Dusen's Scorched Earth, and Noah Van Skyver's Blamo Number Nine. So we have a lot on our plate today. Yeah, that's a lot of books. Before we get into discussing the individual titles, though, uh, let's share with our listeners 
an interview that I did with Dan Stafford, who is the publisher of Kilgore Books and Comics. Uh, as you mentioned, I talked with him at Small Press Expo this year. And on Sunday morning of SPX, before there were a lot of people up and about, uh, he and I found a quiet place and uh, turned on the recorder and talked about his spring releases, the fall releases, as well as the Joe Matt book. Uh, and he gives a little context about what Kilgore is all about, what they're doing and what they've done this year and what they plan on doing in the days to come. So let's go ahead and share that with our listeners. Yep. Let's listen to that. I am here at SPX with Dan Stafford. He is the publisher of Kilgore Books and Comics, both a physical location and a publishing arm. Uh, Dan, how are things going for you? Uh, great. Uh, we're having a really great SPX. It's really, in fact, yesterday I believe uh, was our highest selling day ever at any convention. So we were, we were pretty tickled. At Kilgore's? For Kilgore, yeah, wow. exactly. So we were, we were pretty pleased about that. So uh, we've got uh, four great books that we're debuting here. So I think that has a lot to do with it. One of them is a new issue of Blamo from Noah Van Skyver, who people are pretty excited about. And so that's, a, I think, a pretty good table draw. People kind of come in looking for his book and then check out that, check out our back catalog. So... Yeah. And, uh, you know, the reason why I'm talking with you here at SPX is because we're both here at SPX and uh, we wanted to use this opportunity to, to talk with you uh, for our publisher spotlight on Kilgore. Now, you were talking about the latest issue of Blamo being a, a new release uh, for this fall. Now, we're looking at your releases for 2016. So, uh, tell us a little bit about the various titles. Uh, you don't have to do any deep dives into the, you know, what they're about, but just maybe a little bit about what's notable about them and uh, maybe interesting stories about some. Yeah, sure. Um, so this year we actually published more comics than we ever have, and part of that is um, just by way of background. We started out as a physical bricks and mortar used book and indie comic shop in Denver uh, back in 2008 started publishing comics in 2010, and then um, I actually moved away from Denver uh, in 2011 or 12 and sort of brought the publishing stuff with me. Um, and so the publishing stuff this year for the first year really has kind of peeled off from the shop. The shop is still alive and well in Denver, uh, and it's run by one of our former staffers. But but uh, since we're focused, since I'm focused only on publishing now, I wanted to kind of up our output and up our quality and work with more artists. And so we've got nine books that came out this year. Uh, we had a fall or a spring release of four books, and then we had a, a, one, a one-off we did this summer with Joe Matt, and then we did another four books this fall. And so the spring books we did, <clears throat> the first one is a book called Power Man by Box Brown, which is a sort of fictionalized version of a Donald Trump of Donald Trump uh, if he basically gave up being a terrible person and became an artist instead. Um, and it's a, it's a hilarious book. It's a great send-up. And uh, I will say when Box and I first talked about it, it was a year or more ago when no one thought Trump would be anything. And so I actually at the time was like, I don't know, by the time this comes out, no one will, no one will remember Donald Trump. And, and uh, I was wrong, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> so, so that's pretty funny. Um, the second book that we had come out in the spring was called Cosmic Being Number 2 by uh, a Denver uh, cartoonist named Alex Graham. And her work is very much like, it's very much the aesthetic of 60s undergrounds. It's very cerebral, very surreal. Um, but without a lot of the kind of masculine focus on genitalia, uh, it's, it's just a lot more <laughs> philosophical, I think. Uh, so that's a, that's a really great comic that we're uh, super proud of. There's another book called uh, The Fifth Window by Amara Leipzig, who's a Los Angeles-based uh, cartoonist. And that's just a really thoughtful meditation on life. It's the story of a monk who is um, creating stained glass windows in his uh, uh, tower. Uh, which, and it's just a really beautiful... Uh, tender story, and then we did a collection uh, from a woman named Lauren Barnett called uh, "A Horse, a Crow, and a Hippo Walk into a Bar." And Lauren is like the opposite end of the spectrum. She does like great humor comics. She's one of the funniest cartoonists, and these are three standalone stories about animals that are just the worst beings on earth. They're just terrible, rude, narcissistic, horrible people. So it's a really fun little book. That was our spring collection. Then we actually did some work with Joe Matt, who, uh, as you may know, has not actually done new work in a long time, and he wanted to do a little bit of a send-up of his buddy Chester Brown's book, uh, 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 paying for it. And so he sort of repurposed some of Chester's artwork into an eight-page joke, basically, 
um, that's wildly inappropriate, uh, but really fun. Uh, and then, and so we did that with him just as a little one-off thing. And then this fall, uh, the books that are debuting at SPX, there's the uh, Blamo, and then there's a book called What Happened by Simon Moreton, who's a British cartoonist who has a very minimalist style. And again, I think he's a very poetic cartoonist. And then we have um, uh, a book called The Plunge, which is by Emmy Guinness, uh, who's a, actually a comics professor, uh, so you, you, would, you would like her. And um, she, uh, that's the story of the first person to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. Uh, it's, a, it's a really sad story as well. Um, and then we have um, Tom Van Dusen, who did a, a, a collection called Scorched Earth that's a, a, a book, not a pamphlet comic. And that's about a, a, an alter ego character named Tom Van Dusen, who's just a, the worst person on earth and kind of barrels his way through life, just like harming everything he touches. So uh, we kind of run the gamut between these like sweet poetic comics and humor comics and thoughtful comics and introspective comics. So. So a variety of, of, of tone and genre. Yeah, we try to we try to be the thing I look for most in is really great writing. Um, I think for for me, I love comics that are great stories. So I look for people that are really good storytellers because um, I feel like the art then complements it and, and works well in, in juxtaposition with it. So yeah. Well, now you're talking about the kind of uh, works that you're you're looking for and uh, that kind of variety. Now of, of the the many people that you mentioned that you're publishing this year. Um, you know, Noah Van Skyver, you've published a number of works of his. Uh, I mean, obviously there that, there's that connection. How do you find the other creators? Do they come to you? Do you approach them? It's a little bit of everything. I mean, so the, the mission of Kilgore, I should say, is that we, we, we want to be like a stepping stone for cartoonists. We want to identify cartoonists who are really committed to comics and are really like work hard, have a good work ethic, but are aren't ready to make the jump to doing a 200-page graphic novel. And there's, there's only a few outfits like us, I think, that, that provide creators who are newer to comics with an outlet to do a 40-page pamphlet comic or a, a, you know, maybe an 80-page collection. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's an, important, it's an important niche that we fill in the, in the comics universe. And so with that in mind, at, it's at events like SPX. I'll go around and pick up a ton of mini-comics and try to find creators I like that way. We also have done uh, our... Uh, anthology called the Cohort Quarterly, which I know you've read. And so that's the way we've found some artists in the past. We just get people who submit two or three page uh, thing to the quarterly, and then we kind of go, oh, this is a great cartoonist. Do you want to do a full book? Um, and then I think we're getting a little more well-known now, and so we're getting more people that kind of reach out to us. So Tom Van Dusen, for example, is a Seattle cartoonist, He's a super great guy, and I've met him at a couple cons and bought his minis. And I think I tweeted, like, Tom Van Dusen's the funniest cartoonist ever. And then he wrote back, hey, do you want to do a book? And I was like, yeah, let's do a book. And so then a month later, we did his book. So it's, it's pretty mellow. <laughs> now, you, I guess you started off doing the, the, the pamphlets, uh, but with Van Dusen, it's, it, it's a book. Do you find yourself growing in such a way that you feel that Kilgore will publish more books in the future? That, that is a really great question. I think the... I have some anxiety about it because, honestly, I think that to make money, books are where it's at because it's not that much more expensive to print a book than it is to print a pamphlet, but you can charge $20 instead of $6. And so the profit margin on a book is significantly higher. Um, that being said, I do think our philosophy of wanting to provide an outlet for cartoonists and, and to provide them with um, stock, you know, so when we can print up a 1,000 or 2,000 copies of a comic book, that makes sure that artists can sell their work at every show they go to versus when you're self-publishing, you print 50 copies. You might sell out. You might not have time to make them for the show, whatever. And so I'd l I like the idea of doing more books, but I don't want to just turn into I'm, – I'm not interested in becoming a big publisher. I have no very little interest in that. I kind of like being a struggling <laughs> small publisher. <laughs> yeah. You know, as you were saying that, I was thinking of uh, some other examples of brick-and-mortar stores that have started to publish their own comics. You know, there, there's Big Planet, uh, there's Locust Moon, uh, Bergen Street, and, you know, there's some of those that continue with, uh, you know, emphasizing the pamphlet like Big Planet, and then others that do these really expensive, expansive books like Locust Moon. Um, I mean, how do you see yourself in this relatively limited uh, community of stores that then become publishers? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it gives you when you've run a when you've run a comic shop, it gives you a really interesting perspective on what people like to read and how people approach comics, which I think is 
really valuable as a publisher because as a as if you're just a publisher you kind of view it one way but if you've got this other background in the in the more commercial side of it it's kind of a i think a different version and i think all too often when i was when i was only a, a, a retailer i was really frustrated because i would tr i would want to get publishers to like kind of pitch me their books and and sort of help teach me how to sell their comics because um, a lot of times people who come into a shop come in with this attitude of like, yeah, what's good? What should I read? And then you have to kind of interview the customer almost and find out what they're into, and that can help you direct them. Because if you give someone a bad comic, they may not be likely to pick up another one. But if you give someone a comic that really means something to them, they're going to get kind of hooked on it. And so you got to be pretty conscientious of that. So I think it, um, I think it, I think that's really valuable. I do think though it's interesting because the, all the examples you gave, not all of them, but like it's a lot of work to do both sides of the equation. So like Locust Moon, they're not a shop anymore. They're just a publisher. Um, the Bergen Street Comics, I think they're just doing, if I'm not mistaken, I think they're just, I think they're just doing publishing now too. Um, Retrofit, I think, they're probably the company that I, th I identify with the most. I'm good friends with Jared and Box, and, and I think the work that they do, the way they do it, their aesthetic about it, everything is just really spot on. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, that of, the, of all those examples I listed, the one that's closest to what Kilgore is doing is Big Planet and then, then Retrofit, uh, yeah, yeah. then working together like that. Very similar kind of, of, of products, same variety, comics. Um, yeah, it, it's really impressive. So in the uh, – okay, we're talking about the 2016 releases. What do we have look, to look forward to in 2017, or is that jumping the gun too much? No, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, uh, there are definitely a few things uh, that I'm interested in. There's a, there's a few artists that I've talked to. Hey, Yitzi. Um, uh, I've talked to uh, – about working with – there's a woman from Minneapolis named Caitlin Scal, Skalrud, Skalrud. Um, who just went through uh, the, I think it's MCAD, where Zach Sally's a professor, and so she was one of his students, and they've done a bunch of comics together on, on his press, Lamano. Uh, and her stuff is great. It's the really, uh, she's the beautiful, she, and she did Houses of the Holy with, I can't remember if that was 2D Cloud or Uncivilized. Uncivilized. It was Uncivilized. I think, I think yeah. it was a joint thing. Oh, it was a joint. Okay, that's, yeah, that's right. I was just like, but, uh, and that's just an incredible book. Um, so we're talking to her about doing a pamphlet comic. Um, I think Noah and I are talking about doing a – we're pretty excited about this idea of doing um, – continuing the Kilgore Quarterly, but doing a little bit more of a curated anthology of kind of literary comics. So reaching out to artists like – like Josh Cotter, for example, is an artist that I, I just love his work so much. And he's doing this massive nod away project. And so I was actually talking to him last night. I was like, hey, if you ever want to do like a five-page short story just to kind of take a break from nod away, let me know because I think I could – I think we'll have a home for that. Um, and so I like the idea of, of sort of working with four or five artists every year to do a, you know, a, a nice anthology of, of literary comics. I, I sort of like that idea. Um, and then other artists, I, there's, a, there's a handful out there that I'm, I'm thinking about reaching out to, but I, I usually, after SPX, I usually kind of collapse into myself for a little bit and then kind of get refocused on it in, in October, November time frame, so... Well, we should mention, since we're here at SPX, yeah. that you're one of the organizers of SPX. And so, you uh, you know, you've been very busy this weekend, so I appreciate you finding some time to talk with us. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to help. Well, when I, when I left Denver, I came here to, um, uh, to the D.C. area, and my background is in community organizing. I did, I did that kind of work for about 15 or 20 years, and, and, uh, and so I got in touch with Warren Bernard, who's the executive director, and I said, hey, I'd like to volunteer. Um, and, uh, and I said, I, cause I used to manage the big teams of people and I was like, I don't want to do any management. I don't want, I don't want any responsibility. I just want to like lift heavy boxes. I just want like a brainless job where I can chat with people about comics. And so I, he very quickly cajoled me into becoming the volunteer director for, <laughs> for SPX. So, uh, so that didn't work out quite as I thought, but it's, it's SPX, I think is an incredible organization. So, and I, I, I don't know how much you know about it, but SPX does a lot of programs year-round in the D.C. area. So there's a, the Graphic Novel Gift Program and, and the partnership with the Library of Congress, um, uh, and obviously the work with Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. So there's a, a really interesting ongoing community of, uh, of comics here in the D.C. area that's been really fun to get to be a little bit of a part of. So Now, you said a moment ago that many people who, whose work you publish – um, you reach out to, but then people have been getting in touch with you more and more. So if our listeners have work of their own and they want to contact you guys and see if this is something that may fit with uh, Kilgore, how do they get in touch with you? Yeah, our, our website's the best way. It's kilgorebooks.com, and there's a little – there's a one of the pages is sort of if you want to submit work, and it's got our address and stuff. Um, and I should mention, by the way, when you're asking artists we want to work with, there's a, another guy in Chicago named Sam Sharp who – 
he did uh, Viewatron, a couple issues of this comic called Viewatron uh, over the last couple of years that I think are just wonderful. And so uh, he and I have been talking about doing a book, too. I wanted to, to mention that. Um, but, yeah, we do get a lot of submissions. And, you know, it's funny because what I look for, um, I look for people who have a proven track record of kind of hoofing it with comics. Like, I want people who are going to work hard to m- make it and do it. Not, not something that's like... I just came to this, and I'm going to try this thing, and we'll see what it's like. Or I think a lot of people who do comics might be might consider themselves as general artists, and then this is the comic they do. That's fine, but that's not the thing we're interested in. I kind of I, Noah is sort of the model for me, where like if Noah if comics didn't exist, I don't he would be like a ditch digger. I don't I don't <laughs> I can't imagine what else that he would do other than comics. Um, and he's so good at promoting himself. In a, in a wonderful way, and he puts so much work into his work. Uh, and that's we want to support that. We want to support people with that type of artistic vision um, who are just rough around the edges and, and, and maybe haven't quite found their way yet. Because honestly, when, when, I, when Noah first came into the Kilgore, he had Blamo 2, I think, or no, Blamo 1, he didn't have 2 yet. And it's not a great comic, but there's like, you read it and there's seeds. And I remember saying to Luke, the guy that I own the shop with, I was like, if this guy keeps doing this, it's going to be really good. And then thankfully, every six months, he came in with a new issue, and every issue was like 10 times better. So in terms of what I look for, that I look for people who can show that they're hoping to grow and hoping to develop and want to tell a good story, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, we do get a lot of submissions. We get a lot of really, really great submissions. And I'm, I'm starting to find uh, there's just so many great cartoonists out there. So. Well, you're going to have a lot to, to, to keep you busy with with Kilgore uh, over the next uh, several years, we hope. But uh, I'm glad that we had the opportunity to talk here at SBX. And uh, uh, also a great chance to talk about all of your books in 2016. So, uh, hey, good luck with the rest of uh, SBX. Thank, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate you taking the time. And, and thanks for doing the podcast, too. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I have a couple of little kids at home, and I do all the Kilgore stuff. So I usually it takes me like four days to get through a full podcast. But the, the, the detail and depth that you guys go into on work, just makes me so happy. It's like exactly what comics need. So thanks oh, for thanks thank for you. We it. appreciate that. <laughs> Excellent. So yeah, that was fun seeing Dan and talking with him about uh, the Kilgore releases, and it, it really did provide uh, a good context for what we're about to discuss. Yeah. Uh, so let's go ahead and discuss these books, and let's begin with Alex Graham's Cosmic Being Two. Right. And, uh, and for our listeners, um, this Alex Graham shouldn't be confused with the Alex Graham who created the beloved comic strip, Fred Bassett. Yeah, this is, this is someone else. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, now were you familiar with Alex Graham before cosmic being two? Uh, no, I wasn't. So you did not know about cosmic being number one. No, no. From what I understand now, did, did Alex, Graham uh, self-published that that book, and then Kilgore picked up the series with number two. Yeah, that's um, that's what I gathered uh, from the yeah. inside notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is, I guess, we could describe this as a single author collection or anthology. So here, Graham has a, a variety of different comics. I guess the the longest of which is a story, the first part of a story, Angloid. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was penciled in 2012 and then inked in 2015. So now, how would you describe the comics of Alex Graham? Well, Angloid is, it seems, semi-autobiographical, right? Right. Uh, um, the, the Angloid character in the book is, um, you know, is a version of Alex as, um, you know, I guess as, as she goes through several experiences on her way to becoming a creator, mm-hmm. and um, and then there's other there's other shorter works that are are much more kind of abstract, I guess, uh, in their in their style, especially um, some some have humanoid characters, but men, some don't, um, and a lot of them are, I guess, kind of introspective. I would say. Oh yeah. And in fact, even the Angloid story mm-hmm. includes non-humanoid characters. And so in this way, the, I guess, semi-autobiographical or more reality-based narrative is intruded upon by some kind of fantastical world. Right. 
like I guess some kind of alien the way that this creature is drawn <laughs> because it is shown at times in what looks like outer space. It has large ears, uh, a tail, and floats around. And at times interacts with uh, the title character. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess with Angloid, we see um, her character having um, having some kind of, I guess, self destructive tendencies, um, and uh, that that um, the story uh, is isn't always documenting those. Um, those mistakes. Right. And, and she's an artist, uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, a painter. So, yeah. uh, and in fact, when I was looking up, uh, earlier, some of the work of Alex Graham, I, I saw some YouTube videos of her doing some paintings. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so it definitely does fit into the, I guess, autobiographical context that I assumed was here. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, now you mentioned some of these more abstract, shorter works that follow Angloid. Um, and mm-hmm. one of them, I guess the one that immediately follows, <laughs> is curious. Uh, it's called Cruel. And basically we have someone, and, and you know this, this could be Graham or just some, someone else, uh, talking with a creature that has the head of a cat. But it, it, it's a photograph of a cat's head. With right. with the eyes looking particularly creepy. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, and you know I I think that with with cosmic being what 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 you're getting is you know um, the uh, a single author collection of of shorter works kind of framing around this this one longer work it's Angloid which uh, from the sound of things is going to be serialized through later issues of this. Um, of this book as well. So I'll be curious to see what um, the future work of Alex Graham's looks like is, are we going to see, for example, an Angloid collection once it's been completely serialized in cosmic being um, are the, the shorter works, are we going to see return a return of some of the characters and, or, you know, figures or even styles that are in the shorter works. Um, and you know maybe those are in cosmic being no, number one since you know I haven't seen that I'm not sure, mm-hmm. uh, but th- I think there's um, you know uh, I'm curious to see what uh, what Graham's work uh, what more comes out from Graham with uh, with the taste that we get here in this book. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and I'm wondering if we'll if well if, if she has a penchant for anthropomorphic characters. Uh, right. We don't really get that in this first part of Angloid, but we get them in the shorter pieces that follow. Now, you know, I mentioned uh, that uh, cat-headed individual mm-hmm. uh, with a photograph earlier, uh, but but there are a variety of other comics, uh, other shorts, where you have humanoid characters who have animal heads. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, there's one piece toward the end called Small Talk Through the Ages, and you have a collection of individuals, each with an animal head of some sort, standing around talking about, I guess, what one would have talked about Small Talk-wise in 1979, and then in the panel underneath that, uh, other creatures doing the same thing in the year 2015. Right. <laughs> so, and, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, it's interesting. Um, I, I do appreciate Graham's sense of humor. Mm-hmm. So, well, we'll see what happens with uh, Cosmic Being 3, which I hope will be published through Kilgore. Yep. Um, So let's move on to uh, the second work we're going to be looking at, which is part of the spring releases of Kilgore Books and Comics. And this is Amara Leipzig's The Fifth Window. Right. Now, as uh, Cosmic Being was was more of an anthology, um, The Fifth Window is it's pretty much a single narrative but it is one that is kind of punctuated by shorter narratives inside of it uh and and so basically we start out with um this this character is a narrator who um it looks basically looks like a monk mm-hmm. um 
dressed in a robe with a shaved head who who climbs a, a tower that's kind of a, a lighthouse that um and his job is to design the various windows at the top of the lighthouse that are in these these kind of ornate stained glass patterns each one revealing um something about his life mm-hmm. and or about his past and he comes to the the fifth window is is not been completed yet and so hence the title of the book uh and so um he is contemplating what he wants to do with with that fifth window and um and then we get flashbacks i guess to or either earlier times in his life or maybe other stories that um that inspired him not just this uh not just the win- the fifth window but pa- past windows as well for example the first kind of short narrative we get in here is is that a, a boy who goes out in a boat with his father during a, th- a lightning storm and they go chasing the lightning and that seems to be the um that seems to be what the second window is is meant to depict, um, and so on. And so um, we're finding out. We see him working a little bit, I guess, on what the fifth window might be. But that then leads to a um, a story about two people. I don't think this is the narrator anymore, uh, but two people who are um, camping. Camping, yeah, and are, 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 I guess, lost in the desert. Yeah, and that seems to be, I guess, what we see on the fourth window that he walks by toward the beginning of the book. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you in that in this second story that is inserted into the frame mm-hmm. of the monk and the windows, mm-hmm. uh, neither the characters who are part of this story seem to be the monk at all. I mean, it just visually right. looked quite different. Um which leads me to wonder if that first story that you referenced of the mm-hmm. young boy going out on the boat with his father, I mean, if that's someone else entirely and not the, right. the monk younger self. So, you know, we could read at least some of these stories that, you know, it, it, it's the monk's life that he's reflecting on and uh, inserting into the windows, or it could be other lives as well. Sure, ex- exactly, exactly. It could be. I mean, there's there, there's clearly something going on here when he when he reaches the empty window and looks at the moon and so on and and is is talking about inspiration. So there could be something again here about where the um, the the different windows represent inspiration, the narratives that he is coming up with that the windows capture a, a moment of. Um, so we're, we're not quite, we're not quite sure if we're getting flashbacks into his past or, um, kind of original narratives that he's creating or something else even. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, um, this book becomes quite contemplative and, and, and kind of soft in ways, uh, in terms of mm-hmm. its, its narrative in places and especially those transitional moments between, let's say the monk speaking and those interspliced narratives that that we had mentioned. So, for instance, um, right before that first story of the boy going out in the boat with his father, uh, the monk says, um, I've made these windows beneath your bright light, talking to, uh, I guess, about the moon. My body bathed in your radiance, and yet, where are the visions now? All I feel is emptiness between us, a leap of faith, and then we get into that story with the boy. And then after that, uh, we get the monk again, and he says, And the moon high above it all, I forget how strong the pull feels, like a tide when it comes in. It wants to pull me all the way out until mm-hmm. I'm lost and tumbling. It, and then it goes on. And then we get something similar as a setup for that second story of the two people out camping and getting lost. Um, so, you know, in, in some ways you could say that the fifth window is a rather philosophical text. Right, right. And I, I feel like it's it's a book that, you know, and when I was when I was reading it kind of in the midst of reading the other eight, I guess, works we're covering in this in this episode, it's one I felt like I maybe needed to spend more time with, uh, maybe going over it again and kind of feeling it out because it's not a I don't think it, it 
it yields everything right away. Right. You know, all, all of its kind of meaning or sense or feeling or whatever. Uh, so I, I did want, uh, I did hope to maybe later contemplate this one a little more. Yeah, exactly. So this is a contemplative text that requires more contemplation. Right. Yep. Uh, it, it's it's definitely one whose, I guess, value and the intentions uh, aren't there right on the surface. Like the mm-hmm. next book we're going to be discussing, uh, it's one that you have to, I guess, let ferment. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. read a few times and 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 let sit for a while. So and that again, that's in contrast to the book that we have next, which is Lauren Barnett's "A Horse, a Cow, and a Hippo Walk Into a Bar." Yeah, and this "A Horse, a Cow, and a Hippo Walk Into a Bar" is is three three separate short stories. So the the title, which makes it sound like there's a there's a, a joke involved, um, <laughs> does does set up, I guess, the expectations you're going to have for the humor of the book. But it's basically three. Um, yeah, three different stories. Uh, if you call them stories, more like three different monologues, basically, by yeah, these three yeah. different characters. And uh, the horse and the crow in particular are kind of foul-mouthed. Right. <laughs> the the hippo has, has a bit of a different personality from... Uh, from the first two. Yeah, in fact, on the first page of the hippo story, and this one's called Nimples the Helpful Hippo, uh, the hippo says, I'm polite. Right. And then, in fact, uh, the hippo calls himself, or I guess it's herself, uh, polite more than two or three times in this, <laughs> in, in this monologue. But but there's a, there's a side to the hippo that, that's not so polite as well. Well, yeah, the... The, the politeness can be a bit overbearing, right? right? That he or she wants to be the absolutely most polite creature. Mm-hmm. Uh, as, uh, there, as, as she states, there, there are two, there are two important things. The most important thing you can take away from my teachings is that politeness matters. <laughs> Every should strive to be as helpful as possible and the second most important thing is that you will never be as polite as me. You can try, but you never, ever get there. Right. Uh, so th- I, I think that, that captures that captures Nimple's uh, personality. Yeah, and, and the darker side of that comes on, you know, the I guess the second to last page of illustration where uh, Nimple's says after, you know, you will simply never be as polite as me, never. And then underneath never is moron. Right, and there's a look on Nimple's face that kind of underscores that. Mm-hmm. But you're right; the first two monologues, that of the horse and that of the crow, <laughs> mm-hmm. are uh, quite a bit more foul. Mm-hmm. I want one more thing about Dim- <laughs> about Nimple's though is the um, the cross stitch she did for tenth grade home ec, which says, "If you're not doing a good deed, you deserve to die a slow, painful, <laughs> horrifying, fiery death." Uh, and apparently she got an F on that cross stitch um, from her home act teacher. You know, I, 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 w- I was thinking when I read this, I would like for someone to to cross stitch me this kind of message, and I would put it up in my office. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So if our listeners out there are adept at <laughs> cross stitching, if you want to uh, maybe a gift for uh, the upcoming holiday season for me and Andy, you can cross stitch us a, uh, a message, a uh, little, uh, I guess, uh, what would you call this? A hanging that says, if you're not doing a good deed, you deserve to die a slow, painful, horrifying, fiery death. Yeah. yeah. And we can so. take a picture of it and share it with our, uh, our audience. That that would be great. Yeah, um, but the other two I, stories though are just uh, really really funny. Uh, the first one, <laughs> the title says it all. I'm a horse, bitch. Right, right. So we have, um, yeah. So this is a another monologue by a horse who um, who is yeah who's who's pretty egotistical and foul mouthed. Um, my favorite thing, the horse. 
says is I read books that would confuse you <laughs> and then has a pile of books that includes uh, Gravity's Rainbow, Finnegan's Wake, uh, Twilight, <laughs> The Sound of the Fury, <laughs> and, uh, and, says, and then says, I'm smart as fuck. Now, that is something I would also like. like I mean, I, I, I was, I'm going to, you know. A cross stitch uh, that says, I read books <laughs> that would confuse you. I'm you know, smart, I'm as, smart fuck. as fuck. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to at least take a picture of that and post it on my office door. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Won't you have to white out the word fuck, though? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the department chair. Okay, Mr. Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you do is okay, right? Yes, exactly. You know, what I found curious about that illustration, you know, I read books that would confuse mm-hmm. you, that, that stack of books, the only one where you have the author's name is Gravity's Rainbow, right? So we don't have uh, the authors of the others, you know, Sound and the Fury, Finnegan's Wake, or Twilight. Uh, right. And I'm wondering why, but why not? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, though, uh, Barnett did put the apostrophe in Finnegan's Wake, and as in, as any good Joycean who's smart as fuck knows, <laughs> Finnegan's Wake doesn't have an apostrophe in it. Mm. Gravity's, Rain- Gravity's Rainbow does. Mm. Well, maybe it's a good <laughs> thing that uh, <laughs> that Barnett didn't include Moby Dick without a hyphen. That's that's true too. Yeah, that would just uh, kind of underscore the opposite of being smart as fuck. Yeah, I guess the the apostrophe in Finnegan's Wake for a, a British modernist like me is the is the same as putting as leaving out the hyphen in Moby Dick <laughs> for a uh, for an Americanist like you. Yeah. Um, and then the second monologue is "Looking at Stuff Is for Chumps" by Barry the Blind Crow, and <laughs> what you have here. Uh, are the the words of a crow, Barry, who's blind, and much mm-hmm. of the humor is based on the fact that he's blind. Because he he starts off by saying, "Hey, dudes, I'm Barry. I'm blind as shit. Look, don't feel sorry for me. I'm super happy, even though I'm so fucking not able to see anything." Yeah, yeah, I like how how Barry does not allow his blindness to be. Um, to get to get him down you know he's he is um he's great his life as he says my life is pretty sweet totally better than your sad tv watching shit existence <laughs> so um you know so so good good for barry yeah. now you know i think with what we're thinking what we're seeing with these first of all is i think that with the with the first two especially uh barnett gets a lot of mileage out of uh, having animals swear, yeah, and and that is that is potentially endless endlessly funny, but um, <laughs> that uh, that's also a kind of pretty easy thing to do. I think what where it it goes to another level. I think first of all with nimples, you get a really I think kind of fascinating personality that comes out, and and nimples does swear too. Uh, not as much as the others, but also with with Barry, that it is it is more than just the fact that he he swears all the time, but that he's so defiant about his um, his situation. You know, no matter what um, you know drawbacks or he might have to being blind, his life is he is convinced that his life is way better than anybody else's. Yeah. Um, and in fact, my favorite part of Barry's story is. Is this one? He says. Sometimes I'm sitting up here with my buddies, like on a on a on a wire. And mm-hmm. trust me, I have so many buddies. This whole wire sags. It's so heavy with my pals. And some new guy is always like, "Oh man, Barry, look at that pigeon!" And everyone gets all quiet. So then I'm like, "Where, man?" Because I want to keep him talking so I can follow his voice. And then I slide up next to him and I peck his eyes out. And I'm like, "Yeah, now you've been buried." <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and these are fun. So, you know, if you come to Barnett's a horse, a cow, and a hippo walking to a bar expecting I guess traditional storytelling in comics form, um you're going to be disappointed. Uh this is mm-hmm. more of a humor-based book than anything. I mean, so so really no no there's no narrative. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, as you put it, you know, three monologues by three characters, a horse, 
a crow and a hippo uh, and having a good time doing it. So it's simple and funny. Yeah, and one one of the other things Barry says I should men- I'd like to mention is that um, he he identifies blue jays as being the dick dickiest of birds, <laughs> and I would I would probably I think my dogs would testify to that because my dogs chase after birds constantly, but it's the blue jays that kind of seem to taunt them the most. Yeah, uh, they 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 sit they sit like on the fence and they don't go anywhere, whereas other birds will yeah will run away. Um, so yeah, so maybe Barry's on to something there, but yeah, yeah. And, uh, when you said, you know, yeah, they're not, they're not traditional narratives. Also each, each page is a single panel. Right. Um, so there's the, the sequence, the sequencing of panels is, is like, is laid out like that. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I was just looking at that part where you had mentioned uh, about the Blue Jays being the dickiest of birds. And then right next to it's another funny moment where we see potentially a softer side of Barry. He says, this may surprise the shit out of you, but I love butterflies. I know I can't see them, dipshit. I just like knowing that they're beautiful. Moths, however, can eat a dick. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. So this this is funny. I mean – for for sheer laughs, this is one of the books that we're discussing this week that you could definitely turn to. Right. I think an, another book that is is based on humor, but a, a very different kind of humor, is Box Brown's Power Man. Yes. Um, and now, Power Man um, is a fairly short comics about 40 pages or so right uh about um a man named Gary Beesh who <laughs> comes from a really wealthy family uh and um and kind of builds his success i guess through the construction business mm-hmm. um and he has big big head of orange hair and a big ego <laughs> and a big ego right <laughs> Is is this all starting to sound familiar, dear listeners? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So it's it's uh, it, it's interesting. You know, one of the things I like that Box Brown can do in a, in a fairly short narrative is is he cover he can cover almost you know a person's almost in their entire life, um, and he never uses like clear distinctive transitions from one one time to the next. Right. So it just kind of, you know, requires you to, to, to follow along and figure out where it's going. It may be that the, you know, the main character's appearance changes or something to look a little older, a little heavier maybe, uh, or something. But, um, but it does, it does cover a pretty, a pretty long period of time, even going into what we would guess is the future mm-hmm. of Gary Beach's uh, life after getting out of the business world. Yeah, and you know one of the things that that Dan said when I talked to him in SPX was that when you know this book came out in the spring of this year, I talked to Dan in September. So, you know, this was a couple of months before the presidential elections. You know, and Dan had thought, okay, so this is kind of funny, you know, making fun of Trump and all, but after the 2016 elections, you know, will this have the same kind of resonance? You know, little did he imagine that, uh, you know, the guy that Box Brown is poking fun at here uh, would be elected uh, the 45th president of the U.S. And we can probably imagine that Box is now on a list somewhere. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, if if, if he thought that no one would pay attention to this, uh, he was sorely mistaken, uh, but maybe in a way that he wouldn't appreciate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so (laughs) – you know the the one one of the points that uh, in this book that I think gives the most I don't know kind of concise and even biting critique is is a scene in which Gary Beach is he's he's wrapped himself up in a purple blanket it looks like this is later in the book and he's googling himself which you know I guess you know <laughs> we can imagine the president does and uh he reads a, a story that says Beach's net worth is 2.9 billion if he just invested in a uh you know a, a ba- base fund that followed the market 
uh, and spent his career finger painting, he'd be worth nine billion dollars. <laughs> uh, and this and this, of course, drives him nuts. And and so this one of the one of the aspects of the beach character that that he uh, that Brown really nails is this idea that he is he is obsessed with his his public image to the point that even if he's getting bad press, um, as he often does. Um, it's, um, he, he's happy just to be, just to be covered. Uh, he's on the cover of the national gossip that says Gary Beach, everyone is a dumb idiot. (laughs) And he says, you know, he's excited that he says to his Butler Gilroy, I'm on the front page. Uh, later on, he's on the Sunday post that says Beach business, bad Beach himself, bozo. (laughs) And then, and then he's he's lying in bed and says, "Oh my God, the cover of eight papers." <laughs> All right. um, so even if it's bad news, he doesn't care as long as he's getting covered, which we 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 know from a lot of different reports that that's the case for our president elect as well. Oh, exactly. Now you mentioned that 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 moment toward the end of the book where he reads that you know if if he you know, began investing his energies in painting, in finger painting, that he would be worth more. And that's one of the funny things about this this short comic is that the story ends with him Mm -hmm. withdrawing from business life Mm -hmm. and going into painting. And so we have a series of his paintings that are, of course, horrendous, one of which Mm -hmm. looks quite a bit like the actual Donald Trump. Um and, and I find this curious because you know we have we already have an ex president uh, George W. Bush who has I don't know if you want to call it a second career in painting but has taken up painting in a more serious quote unquote serious way uh, <laughs> since he uh, left office. Um, so we have what in reality has become our next president who left business to do the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know and. This this idea that um, you know that that if if Trump had simply invested his inheritance or whatever the loan was from his father early on um, in a in this you know pretty basic um, mutual fund um, he would he would be worth way more than he is now is you know something that's been reported uh, about about Trump as well so. Um, and I, I, you know, or that, or that, um, you know, uh, Paris Hilton did a better job of <laughs> taking taking her her family fortune and parlaying it into a much larger fortune. Right. Uh, now, you know, this is something. If you well, if you recall, I interviewed Box a couple months back when Tetris came out, uh, maybe about uh-huh. a month and a half ago. And uh, at the time, I had not had a co- gotten a copy of Power Man, so I hadn't read it. And I wish I had. I would have liked to have mm-hmm. asked him about the whole Trump thing going on during the election when he created this. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to read this until after that interview. Yep. Another, um, go ahead. No, I was going to say another thing I'm wondering about is, you know, as we well know, Box is the publisher of, um, you know, Retrofit uh, and, yeah. and works with Jared uh, with the Big Planet. So I'm wondering the, you know, what went into his decision to publish Power Man through Kilgore instead of through Retrofit Big Planet? Because the kind of book that this is, I mean, this is exactly perfect for the kind of things that retrofit big planet publish well maybe now this puts this puts kilgore on the president's list (laughs) and not and not big planet retrofit yeah okay (laughs) watch out dan (laughs) yeah um check your phones uh well one of uh yeah one of the other things i wanted to mention for anybody who ends up checking this, this this book out is that um, Brown uses a very limited color palette throughout. So it's, it's basically a uh, kind of black and white book with orange and uh, you can guess where orange is used. Right. And, uh, and purple, purple, yeah. or I guess a lavender of some kind. Uh, but anyway, those are the, those are the only, I guess two, two colors plus black and white that run throughout this book. Yeah. 
I like this. This was uh, this was a mm-hmm. fun comic, and I think one of the highlights of Kilgore's output this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's and it's a pretty um, you know uh, concise work of satire that I think nails nail some things that you know. I mean, we're gonna you know if, if satire can st- still even function in our new world. <laughs> this is, uh, this is an example that I think stands out, even though we've already seen enormous amount of satirical work and so on directed at, um, directed at Trump. Yeah. Good book. Definitely check mm-hmm. this out. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're going to move on to a title that figured in neither the spring releases nor the fall releases, uh, and this is Joe Matt's Paid For It. Now, the author is credited here as Chesty Matt. That's right. (laughs) Which is, I guess, Joe Matt's pseudonym, because what Paid For It is is basically – a takeoff on Chester Brown's paying for it Mm -hmm. in which Matt basically has taken panels directly from paying for it and added new dialogue to make, um, to make Chester Brown or Chesty the, (laughs) um, the male prostitute who is receiving the money for services from women. So it just basically flips the, uh, I guess flips the relationships around from the uh, from the earlier from Brown's earlier book. Right now, for those who may not know, uh, paying for it was Chester Brown's. Was it a was it 2010? Is that when it came out? I think so. Okay, uh, yeah, book uh, about his position, his thoughts on legalized prostitution and his own history with that, um, Mm -hmm. how he felt frustrated in uh, various relationships and at one point decided to use a prostitute and then felt okay enough about it to continue the practice. And so the book becomes not just an autobiographical narrative, but also a treatise on uh, the legalization or toward the, you know, arguing for the legalization of prostitution and, and making mm-hmm. quite a persuasive case. And he, the book also becomes, especially in the appendix, a dialogue with his friend Seth, uh, who argues mm-hmm. with him in the notes back and forth about the pros and cons of, of legalization of prostitution. Uh, and also for those who may not be familiar with the work of Joe Matt, Chester Brown, and Seth, is that at least in each of their early works, uh, the three of those, each of them included the other in their comics to where right. they became like the three Canadian musketeers. Yep. Uh, and so we do get – I mean you you got that in paying for it, but you also get this in paid for it as, <laughs> as well. Yeah, but I think one of the one of the funnier things, especially if you're familiar with that relationship uh, between the theory of them, is how how Joe Matt then makes himself look in this book. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there's one point that he uh, met Joe and and Chest and Chesty are having um, having a meal together, and Joe says, "Stop being such a pussy, Chet. If you want romance, go read a Harlequin novel." And Chet responds, "You're right, as always, Joe. I'll try harder <laughs> to master my emotions as you have." Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then, but then later, uh, later, uh, Chet and uh, Seth are talking, and Chet says, "Joe's advice was no good," and Seth says, "Well, Joe's an idiot." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, of course, it's it's Matt's sense of humor and right. the way that he's poking fun at himself here, as well as his friend Chester Brown. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, this 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 is all great. And one of the things I did not do is to fish out my copy of paying for it and try to see uh, some of the visual similarities or the parallels um, mm-hmm. between these two. But um, well, well, they are they are. I mean, it, it is just literally taking the panels out of the other book, right? But but looking at which panels 
uh, you know, Joe yeah. Matt decided to take out, and if there's a particular pattern to it, I, I don't, I don't know if it yeah. is, but right. uh, I would have wanted to have had a little more time to, yeah. to just go through a little more carefully. Plus, it's been a long time since I read Pain for it, and I really like that book. Right. Well, well, one of the things that I found interesting that he does, for example, is that he, he's he's got to, you know, instead of in Pain for it, where we have the scenes of, of Chester literally, you know, paying the prostitutes, um, those things have to happen in reverse. So basically in the, in the sequence that covers kind of the middle spread of this, and by the way, this is only about eight pages long in total. Um, he's just run basically running the panels in reverse Mm -hmm. from the original. So it shows, um, you know, uh, Chester walking in, the woman sets, the woman sets, looks like she's setting the envelope with the money down on, on an ottoman, but really that should be the last panel in the sequence where she's picking it up. Right. That's the woman with the cellulite that he, right, right, right. And yeah. And then, and then he goes to the ottoman, picks up the envelope and takes out the money. Whereas, uh, those panels were in reverse order. So he would put the money in the envelope, set it down <laughs> on the ottoman and step away. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So that's, you know, there, there's some inventiveness going on. It isn't just kind of randomly picking out panels, but uh, having to do things in a certain way so that we get um, that that um, the narrative makes sense that that Chet here has decided to become a male prostitute. Right. And, and this whole idea about com- becoming a male prostitute and then what happens at the very end uh, where uh-huh. he, you know, apparently has, a, you know, a moment of awareness and he wants to change his life. And, and he goes back to the first person who bought his services and he says, call me old fat, call me an old fashioned romantic if you want, but will you marry me? OK, so this is a guy who's just been making quite a bit of money as a prostitute Saying, uh-huh. well, you're going to probably call me old fashioned, but uh-huh. uh, great turn of uh, the table there. Yep. Yeah. I really enjoyed this. And in fact, this is something that you and I talked earlier in the year about discussing on a separate episode, but we decided to hold this to the, the Kilgore spotlight, right. which, you know, mm-hmm. we, we planned on doing anyhow. Yep. So that leads us to the fall releases from Kilgore Books and Comics, and these include uh, Emmy Guinness's The Plunge, A True Story, Simon Morton's What Happened, Tom Van Dusen's Scorched Earth, and Noah Van Skyver's Blammo Number no. 9. Right. Um, of these four, the one the, – the creator that I was familiar with was, of course, Noah Van Skyver. Um you know, if I had heard of the name Tom Van Dusen before, I mean, it, it, it's one that when I heard it, it didn't sound unfamiliar. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, but I didn't know his work, nor did I know the work of Guinness or Morton. Did you know the work of uh, any of those guys besides Van Skyver? Um, now, um, with I, I've seen Emmy Guinness's stuff before. Uh, she does a lot with um, historical uh, narratives. Okay. So, um, you know, if, if you look at her website, for example, um, you can see a variety of the different, um, things she, she's, she's done so a lot of, a lot of which tend to be on, on women's history. It looks like. Mm-hmm. So in some ways, kind of like the work of Andy Warner that we discussed, uh, several weeks back. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, yeah, her work reminds me of that quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Now, The Plunge is a true story about Annie Edson Taylor, who was, I guess, the first woman to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. Mm hmm. And, and that's. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah, but in fact, that, that is one of the areas that that she seems to do uh, to do a lot with is is people especially in this kind of early 20th century era who did um who did these kind of daredevil things sometimes successfully sometimes unsuccessfully mm-hmm. right exactly and so i mean it's it's a fairly straightforward story um 
the thing that I particularly appreciate about what Guinness does is, I, I guess, twofold. One, she complicates the character of uh, of Taylor. In other mm-hmm. words, this is not someone who is as straightforward as, as she's presenting herself to be. Uh, and we get quite a bit of the story based on mm-hmm. that. Uh, and then also, and this comes especially toward the end of this title, is the difference that a woman, especially an older woman, gets in the public light um, for doing something similar, if not the exact same thing, as a man doing it. Uh, so by the time we get to the end of the plunge, we realize that you know this is someone who should have gotten a lot more attention for the thing that she did. Mm-hmm. Uh, much like you know other other people who 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 did this later, and uh, but no, because she was a woman, and because especially she was an older woman, uh, right. she was kind of overlooked. But, but the interesting thing is. As Guinness points out, she probably would have gotten more renown if she had billed herself, as she says here, as the unconquerable granny of Niagara, instead of trying (laughs) to um, frame herself as kind of a younger woman who did this. Uh, And in fact, that gets back to that first point about the complications of Taylor's uh, identity and how she defines herself to others. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's really that's a really good point. I think this does this book does the sort of thing that I think really good a lot of really good historical comics like this do, which is um takes a kind of marginal event in American history, especially or history in general, but American history in particular, and um and kind of shows how it fits within its its particular context. So we're you know we're seeing not only was it actually kind of not only did it become a kind of common thing for people to try to throw themselves over Niagara Falls in a barrel, uh, but that she was doing this because the you know, limited circumstances she had as an older woman trying to avoid basically going as as it says going to the poorhouse right. Um, so what what opportunities did somebody who, you know, as we find out, she's 63 when she does this, this stunt, what opportunities does somebody like that have for living, you know, independently? Right. Because, you know, as, as Guinness points out, she was married fairly young and widowed before she reached 20. Right. Um, so it does bring to light, you know, certain you know, mm-hmm. social, cultural situations. And, mm-hmm. I mean, she's someone who doesn't seem to be forthcoming or honest about her past, right. f- from what we can tell. But then again, you can't blame her because she is positioning herself in such a way to where, you know, <laughs> she will have eventually some kind of means of support. You know, she'll go mm-hmm. over the barrel, become famous, uh, go on tours, and not end up in the poorhouse, which we learn is where she ultimately ends up. Yeah, and I think that you know, um, I think that that the the mis- mystery about her past a little bit is also is also interesting. Mm-hmm. It also makes her an interesting, uh, you know, minor historical figure. So um, one of the other things I wanted to mention, I mean, there's some some really great sequences in here. Especially, I love the way that Gens draws the actual going over the falls right in the barrel and what that's like it it covers i don't know 10 10 or more pages of the book uh just just within that uh but it, at times her style reminds me a bit of chris ware's um and especially in the way chris ware dis- depicts that particular well, not that quite that particular time period, but like the way he depicts the, you know, the Columbian Exposition in uh, Jimmy Corrigan, mm-hmm. um, her her sense of the the time, the dress and stuff, and even her facial expressions, to me look a bit like um, like Chris Ware's and in, in Jimmy Corrigan. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was especially taken by that middle sequence that. Where, where she goes over the falls, where she goes into the barrel, floats over her experiences during that time, the mm-hmm. way that Guinness presents, I guess, what she's going through, what Taylor's going through 
emotionally experientially Mm -hmm. and visualizing this and in the way that guinness represents motion many times is by presenting the same image rep in in repetitious manner many times Mm -hmm. within the same panel so you you know you you don't see like a series of five barrels that represent five individual barrels it's the same barrel but it's moving through space right but we we see that as five different barrels within the same space but of course we understand it's just the one Uh, i like that i also like the way that she uses negative space uh at the part where the barrel does go over the edge Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, and that's a series of about, what, one, two, three, four, five pages. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is a very well-done book. Um, I, I want to get back to something that we mentioned earlier, and that is the mystery of Taylor and mm-hmm. her not being completely forthright about, forthright, forthright about where she comes from. It reminded me in many ways of some of the stories Rick Geary tells – in his murder mysteries from the 19th sure. and even into the 20th century. And it just strikes me as, as curious that, you know, you know, now it's impossible, almost impossible, let's say, to recreate yourself, right, when there are so many mm-hmm. markers of your identity, you know, digitally speaking and otherwise, that are out there to be found, and not just by authority figures, but by anyone. Uh, but, you know, there were times where you could leave one community or one city and go to another and completely reinvent yourself. Right, exactly. Um, that that actually reminds me because um, um, one of the other things that, that Guinness has done is an anthology she did of historical myster- unsolved mysteries that she edited for Hick and Hawk Press called Unknown Origins and Untimely Ends. Mm-hmm. And that includes a lot of creators we like. Some we're going to talk about. Um, also, Noah, Noah Van Skyver's in it, um, and Sam Alden, and and several others. So uh, I'm assuming I haven't seen that book myself, but I'm assuming that um, unknown origins and untimely ends seems to fit with that sort of um, that sort of mystery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hick and Hawk is another one of these publishers like Kilgore and like Retrofed Big Planet. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, really like them. Um, mm. Yeah, I've got to check out more work from Emmy Guinness. Yeah, she does work on the Nib too. I think that's probably where I've seen seen. That's why her name seems familiar to me. Is I check out the Nib pretty regularly. Okay. <laughs> Well, does the name Simon Morton <laughs> no. uh, sound familiar I, did, I wasn't familiar with Simon Morton's stuff before reading this. I don't think, anyway. Yeah, um, I'm the same way. Although, when I first got my copy of What Happened, uh, another one of the fall release titles, uh, I looked at the cover and I thought, huh, this has a somewhat familiar feel to it. And for some reason... I thought of you know the aforementioned Sam Alden. Now yeah. it, it's it's very different uh, in terms of style, especially once I opened it and started to look started to read it. Um, but for some reason, when I picked this up, that's that's who I thought of immediately. Yeah, it ha- it definitely has the same sense of pacing and the way in which Alden will also use long passages of you know of dialogueless panels um, to to capture a mood. I mean, this the um, the main main story in here does not have a lot of dialogue in it at all. No. And basically, what we have here, and and I, it's not easy to decipher. So correct me right. if you interpret this in a different way. Is uh, a series of short pieces that are obviously all interconnected, but that take place over, um, what about a six or seventh month period from April mm-hmm. to December of a particular year. Uh, and I guess this takes place. I think, I think it's 1990, isn't it? Because at one point there's a mentioning of John major stepping down as prime minister. Right. And that was in 1990, wasn't it? Um, I guess 
90, 91. I, can't <laughs> I would have to look that up. <laughs> okay. Uh, but it, it, the early 90s, regardless. And I guess the story surrounds a particular young boy. And we don't – do we know his name? Um, I can't – honestly, I can't remember. Yeah, I, um, I can't recall that he's called by anything. Mm-hmm. Um but it's his experience over this several month period. So, for instance, right. the very first panel, uh, which takes place in April, we see him. This is on the first page. He's looks like he's vacuuming his living room. Uh, he goes out. He's doing laundry. Goes outside. Does some reading while he's waiting for the mm-hmm. laundry to dry. Uh, he meets a friend. Goes over to the friend's house. And they walk around together. Go shopping. Look. Looks like they look at. Uh, VHS tapes, which again should, you know, uh, mm-hmm. contextualize this a bit, and then they go home to to watch a video on UFOs. Right, right, um, and um, yeah, and and Morton's style is is very very abstract. It's you know you, you mentioned Sam Alden. It also reminds me a bit of um, Leslie Stein mm-hmm. in terms of of just the minimal amount of details. And in this case, these characters don't even have faces. Um, and often there there's, they don't have all their body parts showing either. Um, he, Morton leaves out a lot of, a lot of detail. Um, and I think that that makes for an interesting comic to read. Um, and again, since he doesn't rely, um, on dialogue very much either. Uh, I think we as readers have to do, do a lot of, a lot of work to, you know, follow the narrative to, to make sure we're straight on which character is which Mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. This is definitely a book that requires quite a bit of work from the reader, but I mean, work in a Mm -hmm. good way, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's not something laborious that you're going to regret picking up. Um, and so I guess the, the the sparse dialogue and the abstract art at times can be a little confusing where you have to put the pieces together yourself as to what mm-hmm. is happening, getting back to the title of this book, What Happened. Um, mm-hmm. And I think this becomes acute in the very last story or a piece of, of uh, this book. And this takes place over several pages, and it's in September of the same year. Mm-hmm. And it begins, I guess, in a schoolyard because um, the main character and his friend and others around them, they're wearing what looks like school uniforms. Mm-hmm. And they eventually make their way to, I guess, one of their dad's cars. They get inside. They put in a cassette tape, again, which kind of dates this. And they start listening to music. And this is where things – you mentioned the abstract art. Things become progressively more abstract and minimal to where as they're listening to the music and we progress from panel to ma- from panel to panel, from page to page, things get more and more abstract to where we're left with, by the last page, um, completely blank panels. Right. And so it, 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 its abstractness fades into nothingness. Right. Which, again, begs this question, what happened, which is the book's title, mm-hmm. although the title on the book is without a question mark. Yeah, that's right. So it may not be a question at all. It could be that this is a book about what happened instead of what happened. Right. And I like that uh, interesting wordplay there. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I had never seen any work from Morton before. I, I assume he is a writer from the UK. Yeah, because it. it- does seem like this is taking place in in the UK with the John Major reference, among other things. Yes. Well, let's move on to a very different kind of comic, and this is Tom Van Dusen's Scorched Earth. (laughs) Yeah. Now, um, Scorched Earth falls into the, uh, I don't know, an area where the, the main character is... Uh, I guess meant to be Tom. I mean, he, he calls him, he's named Tom. Um, but, um, he's, uh, he's not an incredibly likable character. And I would really hope that this isn't actually autobiographical. Right. In fact, him not being a likable character is putting it lightly. 
Yeah. Um, he, he does some pretty horrible things, especially to, um, these, these women he tries to date, um, including, um, pushing over the porta potty while one, one of them is going <laughs> to the bathroom in it. And yet, and yet she still comes back to him later on. Yeah. It doesn't say much about, uh, you know, <laughs> the woman that he's dating there, that she would come yeah. back to him after that, or, or I guess at any time after first meeting him, because yeah, the, the, the character in scorched earth is, um, well, he, he's reprehensible. Let's just say that. Yes. yes. Yeah, he is. Uh, how he it, 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 it not just with women, the way he deals with people in in general, but I think specifically the way that he treats women, the way he looks at women and objectifies them. Um, I mean, it it, it he, Van Dusen, and maybe we should make a distinction between Van Dusen, the author, and then Tom, the character. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, Van Dusen pushes things to such an extent. To where it becomes really funny and you don't feel guilty laughing along with and also at the character of Tom. Mm. Um, I mean, yeah, I felt like, you know, deming him throughout, but because of the over the topness of what goes on with Tom, I felt that, you know, Van Dusen was asking us to say, OK, yeah, the guy is reprehensible, but just go along for the ride and have a good laugh. Right. Yeah. Uh, And so in this way, it reminded me somewhat of Larry David and Curb Your Enthusiasm. Hmm. That that makes some sense. And this, you know, this guy makes Larry David look like um, uh, look like uh, Dale Carnegie. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and that's not a—it's not an easy thing to do. No, no. Um, so uh, I think, yeah. So this, this, this book is pretty funny on that, on that end. Now, uh, Van Dusen's style, uh, his, his approach, I guess, to the narrative is that e- each page is, is, I think, pretty consistently throughout a six a six panel grid. And rather than using word balloons, he puts the narration and the dialogue in the gutter mm-hmm. beneath each panel. Um, so it, it has a, you know, a, a different look to it and a different way of reading to it than uh, we would get from conventional comics. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, a little over half of this book is, I guess – what we could call a, a single story that's divided into individual chapters, although they, they aren't called chapters as much. Um, and this is that story between Tom and the woman that he meets through, what is it? Is it okay? Cupid is some kind of dating. Yeah. Story. Yeah. Uh, and, and the one that, uh, you know, he abuses, objectifies, but she comes back to him a couple of times mm-hmm. and, and sleeps with him. And so it's about his relationship with her and how he completely screws that up. But then in the last part of the book, we get a section that's basically called Other Stories. And these are smaller bits that in some ways are connected to what we find in the first part of the book because it's the mm-hmm. same character, same context. Um, but they're not necessarily woven tightly in with uh, Tom's relationship with Amy, the woman that he is enamored of in the first right. half. At least at least not until we get to the, the end, the last two parts. Uh, and oh. that are Scorched Earth Part 10 and Scorched Earth Part 11. Yeah. Uh, that are, are I guess, uh, epilogues to the to the main story. But, um, yeah, I, I do what, – of the, of the short stories I do like – um, the one I like a lot is the new boss around here. And I think once you get <laughs> to know Tom's character, this idea that he's, you know, he's nobody, um, nobody is around to, um, to conduct an interview with a new, um, a new employee. Uh, the boss sends Tom to do it, uh, because he happens to know about the, uh, I don't know, type of, software or hardware or whatever sql yeah yeah and um and and so he takes this to mean that he's been promoted and he starts to treat everybody like shit almost immediately Mm -hmm. uh despite the fact that no any reasonable person would have not thought that they had been promoted at this point yeah And, and then he decides to do something very different with this interview when the interviewee 
comes to the office and is using the bathroom before the official interview, Tom yeah. decides that he's going to do something a little out of the ordinary and walks into the bathroom and says, hi, you must be Robert. The guy says, uh, yeah. He says, I'm Tom. I'll be interviewing you today. And then as each of them is standing at a urinal, since I have you here, we may as well get started. <laughs> he yep. starts asking him questions. So I, I think of all the stories in this collection or the the parts of this book, Scorched Earth, this is the most um, curb your enthusiasm <laughs> of the bunch. And, and I can imagine in, in, in my mind as I'm reading this, I was thinking of the, the music uh, from Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, th- th- this is funny. And like you said, I mean, I really do hope that the actual Tom Van Dusen is nothing like the Tom that we get in Scorched Earth. Right. right. Now, according to the, uh, the, the book, these originally, I guess, appeared, um, except for one, uh, e-cigs and mega vapes in Intruder. Uh, which you can find at intrudercomics.com. And I was not familiar with intrudercomics.com before this, and I took a quick look mm. at it, and um, it's worth investigating. Mm. Okay. Okay. Let's get to, I don't know, I, I was about to say the gem of the bunch, but mm-hmm. in saying that, I do not in any way want to downplay the other titles that we've been discussing. Um, but I have to say, I have to be upfront that of, of all the books, the nine that we're discussing this week, uh, this one, Blamo number nine by Noah Van Skyver, is by far my favorite. Well, we've been covering a lot of Noah's work over the over the years, including earlier issues of Blamo. Right, exactly. Uh, so, so in, in that way, I think we're a little predisposed to this, mm-hmm. um, and so but, I, I guess that you know Van Skyver has a leg up in our world. Right, but we're also we're also kind of seeing the we've also seen at least over you know the last few issues of Blamo the you know, evolution of Van Skyver's work on you know things like um, like Saint Cole and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, Fanta Bukowski, but um, but yeah, I mean, I think that you know what what we get with this. I mean, if someone's not familiar with 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 Blamo, um, you know, there's it's usually short, lot of lot of shorter works, a kind of single author anthology. Um, I think that isn't the the um, the notable and tasteful 19th century cartoonist. That's kind of a running deal in his in his uh in blammer right right yeah um and also you know you usually can expect some autobiographical work in here and other short pieces um and so there are there are those things uh but really i think the center of this book and i don't want to skip over anything but just to mention um i think one of the real achievements of this book is the the longer short story that's in here little bomber summer period which is um you know, which is a great short story and one uh, that I hope uh, we see show up in anthologies that announce the best comics of the year. <laughs> yeah, and, and that I think of most of the pieces in Blamo number no. nine is, I guess, the one work of fiction. Right. I mean, you know, there is, you know, as you mentioned, uh, notable and tasteful 19th century cartoonist. Uh, but, you know, that's something that we had seen previously. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a work of fiction. Um, but in many ways, this series kind of folds into the autobiographical comics of, mm-hmm. of, of Ben Skyver in interesting ways, which we can discuss. But I think uh, Little Bomber's Summer Period is, is the, basically the standout work of fiction here. Right. Right. And then and then we have two two longer autobiographical works. One, uh, White River Junction, Vermont, Vermont, which uh, deals with Van Skyver's, shall we say, ambivalent (laughs) attitude toward his experience at the Center for Cartoon Studies 
uh, in White River Junction. I mean, that 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 story is, I think, um, really, really interesting in just how how brutally honest it is um, about that experience. And then the later later one. um, The uh, what is it called? Uh, Just called Comics Festival 2016. Right. Which appears at first to be a autobiographical story, but as it goes along, I I kind of doubt its its authenticity. As right, a, it turns out to be more of a fantasy, a fantasy, and also um, a, a take off on um, the Woody Allen movie. Was it Stardust Memories? Stardust Memories, right? In fact, yeah, yeah. I wanted to uh, <laughs> definitely point out that. Um, you know, when when we interviewed Noah on the show, what was it? Not quite two years ago, mm-hmm. or maybe it was two years ago. Uh, this is around the time of uh, Saint Cole. Mm-hmm. Um, if you remember, he mentioned a particular love of Woody Allen. So he and I were mm-hmm. talking. You know, we could playing off of each other and Woody Allen references. And so when I saw this piece, this autobiographical comic, that is obviously a takeoff of Stardust Memories, of course, which itself is a takeoff of Fellini's Eight and a Half. Uh, right. he, I mean, I loved this comic, this issue of Blamo before. <laughs> That's where he had me, though. Especially when his fans are coming up to him and saying, you know, we love your comics, especially the early funny ones. Right, right. Which is the the dilemma that uh, that Woody Allen is dealing with in Stardust Memories. Right. Uh, in- including the scene in which, you know, duplicating the scene where Woody Allen meets the aliens who tell him, <laughs> if you, want, you want to help humanity make funnier movies. Yeah. In fact, the wording is almost exact in the comic. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um. Do you think that do you think the um the podcast interview then in this is meant to be you? I I don't think so. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but, but you know when I, when I did see that I had wondered, hey, I wonder if there're going to be any any references to the two guys here, but no. No. Um such but, luck. Yeah. So, um anyway, that's that's an interesting. We kind of jumped around here uh, a bit, but um, because there there's so much I think to deal to deal with here. Uh, but you know, is the um, if we're kind of going in the order that the stories appear, that or the earliest story is the white or other than the few sh- first few single page stories, uh, the White River Junction, Vermont story. Um, which was done in August 2015, uh, and Van Skyver is writing uh, you know, a, about his experience there when in the first scene uh, with Center the, for cartoon the, studies. Yeah, yeah, the students are, um, are end up talking about um, Mormonism, which he of course has some experience with. So others who've read his stuff before will know that he he grew up in a a Mormon family until his mother left the church. Mm-hmm. And um, and that raises some some controversy amongst the, his fellow students, and it gets into a bit the issues of, I guess, identity politics and so on that the different students um, are dealing with, and how he comes across in relationship to the you know others' identities as well. Yeah. And things get kind of ridiculous. In fact, at one point, <laughs> and I, I enjoyed this section, um, he's helping one of uh, the older students at the center move some boxes. Mm-hmm. And this student is wearing a T-shirt that says it's Adventure Time. It's, you know, the cartoon Adventure mm-hmm. Time on it. And he's wearing a top hat. Um, and there's a reason why I'm contextualizing that. Uh the guy asks him about you know that previous conversation that you referred to about Mormonism, mm-hmm. and uh, the guy that uh, Noah's talking to is hoping he said, "Oh, I hope I'm not triggering anything." And mm-hmm. Noah says, "What? What does that mean?" And the guy responds, "This school is a safe space. You can talk about anything here. We understand." <laughs> Noah responds, "Why would I tell you about being raised Mormon like I was a victim of it?" What's that about? And the guy goes, what? He says, you know, you're just a 30-year-old, well, what does he say, uh, with, with a wacky top hat and who loves teen girl mags. I don't know you. And, and the guy is, he says, 
he's a little put off by that. And soon after that, Noah is called into the office of one of the administrators to let him know that uh, one of the students, or, or I guess more than one student, says that they do not feel completely comfortable with him. Mm-hmm. How does he put it? Um, that uh, they, he may not be tolerant enough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it just becomes really ridiculous. And, and you know, not to I, – I hate it when, you know, critics start bashing political correctness because more times than not they have no idea what the hell that even means. Uh, but this seems to be, um, I, I think, uh, an informed and educated swipe at some of the extremes of political correctness. Yeah, I mean, I think that what – it, it not, I don't know if it's necessarily a, a, a swipe, but it shows kind of the complexity and the limits, limits of certain of certain kinds of things. Um, you know, right, right. The um, the the issue with this character Max with the top hat and the and the teen girl manga is that um, you know that he automatically thinks that um, that Noah's a victim, right? Because because he he grew up Mormon, right? And that that assumption, that automatic assumption, that somehow uh, someone wouldn't necessarily be traumatized, um, or you know, completely traumatized by that that experience, doesn't seem to occur to this guy. Uh, but I don't I don't necessarily think that Noah's lashing out at him for his clothing choice or his his reading preferences is is necessarily a positive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, depiction, uh, self depiction. So I think what I like about that is that no, that Noah is not afraid to kind of make himself look, um, you know, look not, I don't want to say bad, but make himself look like not, you know, not perfect in that. Right. He can be self critical. Yeah. 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 I, I particularly appreciated that. Um, and, you know, along with this, we're talking about this first story, the first longer story, White Junction, or White River Junction, Vermont. I couldn't help but think of the letter mm-hmm. section of this issue, which is on the inside front cover. And one letter is from Robert Crum, who praises uh, Van Skyver, mm-hmm. his My Hot Date. Uh, he mm-hmm. says that he thinks that uh, – he said, I thought – and I'm reading the letter. I, I thought it was one of the best autobiographical comics ever and captures the abysmal world of teen culture in the 90s so well. More of this. Uh, more autobiographical comics by you. More about your sex life. Get busy. So why in God's name did you decide to spend a year at the Center for Cartoon Studies in Vermont? Was it for the economic reasons? I can't imagine why else you would go there. What can they teach you about cartooning? And – you know, and then there's more to this letter, and and I'm wondering what Noah was thinking in including this letter uh, from R. Crumb on the letters page, and then just a couple of pages later, introducing us to, as you put it, this ambivalent ambivalent take on his time there. Yeah. Well, there's some, I guess, some support. Um. I, I do like the letters, though. I like that he includes the the letter page here, mo- all of which are from other cartoonists. Oh yeah, so we have Tom Gall, <laughs> Jim Rugg, Joe Ullman, Dash uh, Shaw. Yep. Um, right, and um, and so that that um, that experience, but you know, the the ending of that story in White River Junction is, um, you know. It, it has it has a nice it has a nice ending where he you know he goes out into the woods and realizes that you know to to kind of practice um, drawing nature and he has this kind of a this kind of minor epiphany out there right and and I agree with you and I love that as well and it's not just the epiphany but it's you can see here the progress he's made as an right. artist because he says a few pages earlier that he came there hoping that he could practice his art. He says he's good with figures but not so much with nature, and he says at one point his trees look like sticks in the ground. And then by the time we get to that last page of this story, and this mm-hmm. is composed of four different panels, three smaller ones in that top row, and then one bigger one that consumes most of that page – 
I mean, this is beautiful work. I mean, this is highly mm-hmm. elaborate work of, of, of representation of nature, and the trees here definitely do not look like sticks in the ground. Mm-hmm. No, and he says earlier during his, his talk to the, the students at the, at the school, um, when I was starting out with my own comic work, I was looking at a lot of Julie Desai's comics. She would always fill her panels with detail, with with Will Elder chicken fat. Early on, I strove for that level of content. Mm -hmm. I developed my own style based on artists like her, Crumb, Chester Brown, David Collier, and others. I used dense cross-hatching. It was rough-looking. But something happened after years of dedication to your craft. Your work becomes more confident. Either your level of detail sharpens or you lose the detail. You simplify. And that's something I think about a lot now. Uh, And that sequence of five panels actually becomes more simplified until it becomes just a kind of abstract series of lines um, at at the end. But that also... Um, those five panels also for me felt like a, um, a thesis statement for this whole book. Mm-hmm. You know, like I wanted to then go look at, to see how, and then, and then what you said about, uh, about how he doesn't, um, draw nature very well. I wanted to look then at all, all the stuff that he did does throughout the book, you know, does, is he still doing the heavily detailed, backgrounds and so on and and you know the answer for the most part is yes um though i think in a lot of the um in in um in little bomber summer period we do see a level of uh, uh i guess simplification not you know but not quite um I don't know how to say it, a qualified simplification i guess going from you know the really really detailed panels to uh, more kind of precise backgrounds and so on. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you pointed out those five panels on, and we don't have a page number here, but this is in that first story where he's talking with students, and we, and we do get what seems to be some kind of creative thesis here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, also, we get in issue number nine of Blamo two, I, th- I think they're just one page Mm-hmm. Uh, stories that are based on his father's experiences or stories that his father, Noah Van Skyver's father, told him. Right. Uh, one immediately follows that uh, White River Junction uh, story and then another one toward the back half. Yeah, yeah. The one the, in the back half about the praying mantises, which is <laughs> a p- pretty awful prank. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then... And then when we get to the the comics festival. It does feel like that that serves as a as a kind of a bookend to the White River Junction story. Mm-hmm. Um, because even if even if this isn't reflective of an actual festival experience, um, there is um, you know he do, he does talk about his in there his experience at White River Junction and. Um, and some of his artistic struggles as well. Yeah, yeah, it it does seem like the bookend or, or counter positioned or counterposed comic uh, yeah. to what we saw earlier. And I would guess that Noah decided to structure this issue of Blamo consciously, right? That you know he didn't just decide oh i'm just going to throw things in here or there that he wanted to include that that one story that we discussed um little bomber's summer period uh in the very middle and then on either side of that present comics that are not necessarily symmetrically spaced but somewhat so mhm uh and yeah. it and it also begins and ends with <laughs> Or, you know, or that really ridiculous premise of the writer and the artist, because, <laughs> you know, right after the letters page, we get the setup here where we have a young kid is talking to his mother. And it looks like, you know, someone from maybe the 19th century talking to uh, to his mother he says, Mommy, where do Blamo comics come from? <laughs> <laughs> and, and she tells him, said, well, son, I'll tell you, there is a secret mountain way out in a secret location. And deep inside that mountain lives a crooked old man with no shirt that anybody that everybody hates. And mm-hmm. at midnight, every night, he sits down with a cranberry muffin, his favorite thing to eat. He loves them. He saves the bottom of the muffin for his only friend, a head on the floor. The old man talks, and his friend draws, 
while he talks about or what he talks about. And by mm. the time the sun comes up, they have a stack of comic pages. <laughs> and and then of course, I mean the, the idea that this old man in a cave has a friend who is nothing but a head whom he feeds the bottom of cranberry muffins, and that's how they generate their art. I mean, it's ridiculous. But then, of course, by the end of that little one-page tale, the boy is traumatized by this image of a uh, headless body following him around with a sword. Mm -hmm. And then we get uh, the book end of that at the very end of the book. Uh, so, <laughs> it's, it, and that's funny. I mean, you know, there there are other moments of levity, obviously, in Blamo Number Nine, but I think this is most apparent in those stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, you know, this this may be because I have this particular work on my mind all the time lately. But those those two pages reminded me a bit of um, the kind of framing of um, of Justin Green's Binky Brown. Um, meets the Holy Virgin Mary mm -hmm. uh, partially because of the, you know, in, in that the artist has the, has the brush in his mouth and is painting that way too. <laughs> but also because both are these kind of allegories for the, the kind of torturous experience of being a creator. Right. Um, and, but I think that Van Skyver's having a little more fun with it now. Um, you know, Van, Van, Van Sciver also is is pretty kind of brutal about the conditions of being a, an independent cartoonist, as he as he is, you know, um, especially then in the kind of in the front and back matter. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, it isn't it isn't an easy um, an easy life by any means, but um, he does you know he does meditate on that and explore his um his dedication to you know to this craft and the choices that he has made as a as a creator right and you know he he brings these moments of doubt and even criticism not only mm. within the context of his overtly autobiographical comics uh mm -hmm. but also in in other moments as well now you mentioned uh, the you know the inside front and back covers uh there's one place on the inside back cover toward the bottom, uh, you know, the words, why would you become a cartoonist? And we have this reproduction of images of three men, and they have their hands to their head in one form or another. And underneath one are the words, I didn't get enough education, in quote marks. And under the mm -hmm. other guy, I failed to seize opportunities. And then the third, <laughs> I chose the wrong career. Right. So, although you turn the page and you get the final comic, which is on the very back cover, and it's it's tonally the complete opposite, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because we get an, a, another scene of Noah himself in the woods, um, contemplating nature and thinking about his own situation and his art. Um, Mm -hmm. And as he's you know sitting out looking up at the trees and he sees an owl, he says, everything looks so green out here this morning. I can't even hear any cars in the distance. This is perfect. I really did spend my 20s well because he had just mm -hmm. been talking about how he spent his early life in one, especially wanting to be a cartoonist. So, right. I mean, it does in many ways end on quite an up note. Right, right. I um, like this. I like this a lot. Yeah, yeah, and you know, uh, we didn't we didn't talk that much about the the middle part of the book, the Little Bomber Summer Period, which again is is a fictional story. It deals with um, basically two people who work in an art museum. One is a security guard, and one is a graphic designer, and their um, their respective relationships either have fallen apart or are falling apart. Right. And uh, and yet they're they're also friends through work. Plus, um, the the main character, whose nickname is Little Bomber, I guess he goes. Um, he he has decided to also start working on his own art uh, as well. Um, it's one of the reasons why I mentioned at the beginning why I, th I, why I hope to see that you know show up say in the year's best comics. Um, or, or other places like that or get anthologized is because, you know, I, I love that story. And I really think that that's, that's a story that deserves kind of wider attention, whether somebody's putting together an anthology of the best comics of the year or whether somebody's putting together an anthology just of, 
uh, you know, of comic stories that could be used, say, in a classroom or something, that story would be perfect for something like that. Right. Now, this was released in September in time for SPX. So does that mean that it would be a candidate for next year's Best American Comics or the following years? I can't, I can't remember. I can't remember either. Because no. September, I think, is where some of the cutoff is. Right. So. That's what I thought. So, yeah. hmm. Well, if not 2017, then let's hope that it's in the 2018 mm-hmm. volume. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, this is this is a great story. And one of the things I particularly appreciate about it is that Noah doesn't go in a direction that I think many people would expect him to. You know, you, as you mentioned, you have these two people whose lives are falling apart in different ways, but but mm-hmm. also, you know, they're, they're kind of similar situations. Uh, and so I think one reading the story, and, and I did when I first started it, just expected the two people to get together at the end. Right. But that doesn't happen at all. And, and that, that's not a spoiler. There, You know, there are things that we could say about this sto- the story that would become spoilers, and, and we're not going to say that. Um, but that doesn't happen. And I think that's great because that would have been predictable. I think that's absolutely a spoiler. Really? What I just said? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was like, there, I was like on a podcast how you, you, you qualify something like this isn't a spoiler and it's totally a spoiler every time. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, maybe so. Now that you're saying this, I'm thinking, okay, if one would expect them to get together, the fact that they don't, yeah, I guess that does become a spoiler. This isn't a spoiler, but Planet of the Apes is the Earth. <laughs> well, you know, at the, at, but, you know, I think even at the very beginning, uh, Noah doesn't invest much of uh, the possibility of anything going on between these two guys. Yeah, well, the th- yeah, the two characters are are um, you know our work friends, but it seems like that's also each of them their their most positive relationship that they have is with is with each other as friends. Right. Uh, they can they can talk about how their relationships are doing are doing bad or have done bad. Uh, you know, Bomber is going is is seeing um, a therapist who doesn't seem to be helping all that much. <laughs> To say the and least, not, not not as much as not as much as as Jenny, the the friend, and you know she, you know, her her marriage with George plus her, uh, you know her job, both of those things are 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 wearing her down. So it does seem for each of them, the most positive parts of their lives are are each other. Right. Well, you know, Little Bomber found a therapist through Craigslist. So what kind of a therapist can he be? I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he, he's primarily concerned in this comic with his failed relationship with Emmy, his, his girlfriend, that right. he, he had actually bought a house because of her. Right. And so soon after he did so, then she left, broke up, and so now he you know, is not only without a relationship, but he's with a mortgage. Uh, and so the mortgage reminds him of his failed relationship, so he's in the dilemma. So this is primarily what he's trying to work through. And one of the ways he tries to work through that in this story is by creating art. And who is the artist that is being featured in the gallery? Um, Markinson is the yeah. guy's name. And, mm-hmm. and I, I'm ignorant of contemporary art history, so I have no way of knowing if, if Markinson is – you know, based on an actual individual or, or not, but um, it sounds like an, an, a kind of amalgam of different abstract expressionists, especially Jackson Pollock. Right. So, so what Little Bomber attempts to do is he's inspired by Markinson's work and his history, and so he wants to create art like Markinson in order to work through his issues, uh, which, which is kind of funny in many ways because this is a guy who has no artistic background. He's a security guard in a gallery, and so that, I guess, is his entree as an artist. Yep. In fact, his boss even makes fun of him. A uh, little bomber at one point tells him that he's been creating this work. He's been inspired by Markinson. And his boss, which is not known for his empathy, apparently, says, um, why? You know, why would you tell me this? Why should I care <laughs> that a security right. guard is creating art? That's right. derivative. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, this this is really a good story. And it, probably the reason why it sits at the very center of this issue of Blamo. 
Yep. Yeah, so if our, our, our listeners out there aren't regularly picking up, well, any of Kilgore books, comics, you should definitely check out uh, their work. But also, uh, you know, if, if, you're, um, if you're not reading Noah Van Skyver's stuff in Blamo and many of the other, you know, other places that he's publishing, he's incredibly prolific right now. Um, yeah, he's all over the check place. Check it out. Yeah, check it out. Yeah, and in fact, not only check out uh, Noah Van Skyver's various works, uh, which, as we said, are prolific, but make sure that you visit the website of Kilgore Books and Comics, and that's kilgorebooks.com. And keep an eye on Kickstarter, because if they continue to do what they did this year and Mm -hmm. kickstart the seasonal releases, then you can find some great deals, and that'd be a perfect way to introduce yourself to Kilgore Books and Comics. Yeah, exactly. Well, Andy, in our last publisher spotlight of 2016, we had our plates full with nine individual titles. We started with Alex Graham's Cosmic Being 2. Then we looked at The Fifth Window by Amara Leipzig. Then Lauren Barnett's A Horse, a Cow, and a Hippo Walk Into a Bar. Then Box Brown's Power Man, followed by Joe Matz, or Chesty Matz, paid for it. Then the fall releases, Emmy Guinness's The Plunge, A True Story, Simon Morton's What Happened, Tom Van Dusen's Scorched Earth, and Noah Van Skyver's Blammo, number nine. Yep, lots of good stuff there. Yep. And, you know, even though, you, unfortunately, you cannot find Kilgore books through Discount Comic Book Service, they nonetheless offer great deals on other comics. So definitely go to dcbservice.com, get those deals. You will not be disappointed. And again, please check out kilgorebooks.com as well. Yes. And after you do get those books, get in touch with us and let us know what you think about Kilgore Books and Comics. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. That's right. Uh, Or you can get a hold of us by email. We are two guys at comicsalternative.com. Or you can get a hold of us individually. I'm Andy at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. Uh, we also have our Twitter feed. You can check that out at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right. You can also find us on Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, and on iHeartRadio. And if you're an Android user on Google Play Music... But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. That's right. All the ways to get a hold of us and let us know how we're doing. That's right. And we do like to hear from you, so send us those messages. And come back next week. It'll be the first episode of December, where Andy and I will discuss the December previews catalog. Until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Andy. See ya.